Alright everybody, we're in the balcony again. It's Pastor Aaron and Pastor Kirk uh, from uh, from Paragold, Arkansas on the balcony of Redeemer Lutheran Church. It's good to have you today. We are going to ask a question that is always on everybody's mind, which is, will there be football in heaven? Uh, which is uh, something that like, I know is just, you know, been, been with football season starting. Football season about to start. Yeah. You feeling good about this guy? Uh, Not in that uniform anymore. I mean, I'm feeling good about his prospects. Right. I wish that he was wearing our laundry. Right. Um, but so do you, how do you feel about the Patriots? Have you seen our skill players? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not great. Not looking good. Right. Not looking good. Um, but, you know. I think 9 and 7 slide into that 7th, the new 7th playoff spot, I think will sit really nice for the Patriots. I would be, I think 9 and 7 would be great. Huh. And then we'll talk about the off the off season for New England, the Patriots. By the way, if you don't know that we're talking about the Patriots, you haven't been listening to us. Uh, I think I ever think the off season will be very interesting because they're going to have to make a decision about Cam, and they're going to have to do something. Yeah. Something. We'll see if these young guys develop or not. Anyways, uh, will football they, is starting. Will they have to answer those questions when we all see each other uh, in in well new creation? Well, first of all, we got to lay some groundwork before we talk about answering that particular question, uh, Pastor Aaron. So uh, the first thing, which is which is where a lot of people kind of get off track, uh, a a including, you know, people in, in our own pews and our churches might not understand this, is, is first we have to answer the question, what happens when you die? Like, and, and we have these kind of ideas and things that we've seen on TV and culture and read books. Maybe we have this idea in our own mind of what takes place. Um, but what does happen when we die? Uh, according to Scripture, what do you think Scripture says? If we're going to use Scripture as our source of authority, God's Word and what God says, uh, what do you think we can learn from what he tells us about that process and everything after it? So something that's really interesting that sort of happened to us as a church and as a, as a church in a specific culture is that we've gotten this narrative or this story about uh, our existence and what takes place regarding it and so we have this idea that we're born and then we go through this life and then we die and then what happens is our bodies go into the ground and this uh, idea of a soul or a spirit which is this thing that makes up us that is disenfranchised from or separate from the physical body that goes to be with Jesus that goes into the place that oftentimes is depicted in popular culture with the pearly gates with St. Peter standing outside of it and harps and angel wings and fluffy clouds and all that sort of stuff and white robes and that picture, that narrative uh, is just one, I mean, it's not even that it's incorrect per se, I mean a lot of those things are sort of uh, they're, they're conjecture, they're not things that are specifically found in scriptures obviously and we, we want to be very clear that we don't become angels, if that's why we're all getting right. halos and wings then that's a problem, but uh, really what it is is it's incomplete, and the main thrust and focus of the scriptures regarding what happens to us when we die is not preoccupied with the immediacy of what happens when we die, this idea that our spirit or soul, um, what's called the uh, nephesh in Hebrew, is this word that we oftentimes take for soul, and I'd want to show you just a little scripture passage that looks at how even that can be misleading, um, that really the main focus of the entirety of the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, is instead the time of the resurrection. In fact, the Old Testament deals almost not at all with this other period of time that oftentimes we use the word heaven or referring to, which is the time when our bodies are on the ground and our spirits do reside with Christ. Um, the New Testament talks about it little, not much, but little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, St. Paul says uh, to be with Christ, is uh, to, to die is to have gain because it is to be with Christ uh, in the spirit and honestly one of the only other places that we hear about it uh, in a literal sense is the account where Jesus turns to the thief on the cross and says today will be with me in paradise um, we get other sort of symbolic um, or, uh, or pictures of it in parables including Jesus with Lazarus and the rich man the parable that he tells there and then of course depictions like what you've got in the book of Revelation as well but even that you could sort of say is a penultimate symbolic image because even contained within the book of Revelation is this symbolic ultimate representation of the time of the resurrection with the return of Christ. Okay. So 
We talked about hermeneutics a lot. Yes, we did. So a hermeneutic is a framework through which you look at the scriptures, and a lot of times what will happen is if we have this mindset when we're looking at the scriptures that all of the scriptures are pointing to this disembodied soul, the obliteration really even not only of our own bodies but of the entirety of the earth in order that the end game that God truly desires are these nebulous floating spirits that are separated from the physical nature of both our bodies and the earth, then we find that in the scriptures even where it's not present. And Pastor Kirk, if it's all right, I'd like to uh, read a scripture passage. This is from Psalm. This is, this is a psalm. It's from the Psalms, and this psalm is number 16. This is a Joe Montana psalm. Uh, it's not a Tom Brady psalm. It's a Joe Montana psalm. So it's probably the second or third greatest psalm. <laughs> right, right. It's clearly not as good as the 12th. This is football jokes. The 16th psalm is great. I'm not no ranking them there. Um, the 33rd psalm would obviously be the best one there because that's Larry Bird's name. Um, he doesn't even play football. All right. Uh, psalm 16, really quick. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my cho chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. This is the important part. So my flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. I actually think a better translation there is the grave. For you will not abandon my soul to the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. Now, that's David speaking about his own uh, sort of experience that, and his hope that he will not be abandoned, his soul will not be abandoned to the grave, right? I will not, for you will not abandon my neshish to the grave, but instead let your holy ones in corruption. Now, if we have a hermeneutic where what we're looking for in the scriptures when we go to the scriptures is this narrative that when we die, our bodies go into the ground and we go into heaven, we can look at Psalm 16, for example, and say to ourselves, you know, that kind of sounds like what I thought I was talking about. That, you know, he's not going to be abandoned to the grave because even though his body goes into the grave, what's going to happen to his spirit? He's going to go be go with up. Jesus. Right. So that's what this is about. Now, we don't oftentimes get this, but we sometimes get this, where the biblical authors actually interpret Scripture for us. So, Fast forward with me, if you will, to the day of Pentecost. And there Peter is preaching a sermon. And everybody's hearing it in their own dialect, because everybody's there, because it's Pentecost. It's a Jewish yeah. holiday. We went over this in Bible study recently. So people from all over, from the, dis from the dispersions that happened during the exile. And, and then uh, he, says, he says these words. Uh, Peter does. Uh, he quotes Joel first, right? He says, in the last days I'll pour my spirit, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And then uh, he goes on to say this. Uh, I should have marked this out, and I didn't. <laughs> so I'm looking for it. It's in Acts chapter 2. I know it is. I just got to find it. Uh, okay, here it is. Um, David says concerning him, Peter says. Okay, so backing up just one second. God raised him up, him being Jesus, Peter says, loosing the pangs of death. Because it was not possible for him to be held by it, it being death, him being Jesus. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, here is the word. Again, Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades here. The word in this context means grave. He will not abandon my soul to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter there is talking about Jesus' resurrection, showing that when in Psalm 16 it's referring to the fact that God will not abandon 
his body or corpse, which a lot of times neshish, this word that means soul, is used to to refer there. In fact, like so, for example, in the Old Testament, the uh, the person who's called a murderer is actually called a neshish slayer, Ooh, right? Wow. So like that's not slayer of the spirit, like it's literally like a yeah. like a, a body slayer, right? And uh, in fact, you also hear about how people get corrupted when they come into contact with a neshish. You don't get come into contact. You don't get corrupted by coming into contact with a soul. You come into contact getting corrupted with a dead body, right? right? And even a kidnapping is called like a neshish napping, right? So it's very interesting. Yes, and, and it's a physical being, and that's what's right. taking place there. And so Psalm 16 is just one of those examples where you hear David say that he knows that he's going to have his flesh, and that the Lord is not going to abandon him, his his neshish, his being, to the grave, and that Peter actually uh, maps that out fleshes that out as referring to Christ, and we know that the story of Christ is actually our story, the story of the physical resurrection being our uh, hope as well. And this is mapped out in places like Romans 6, where we hear that we are united to Jesus through our baptisms. Because of that, we're united with him in a death-like case, and we'll be united with him in a resurrection-like case. So this changes my perspective completely on what my expectation is and what I'm looking forward to as a person who uh, calls uh, Jesus Christ my Lord. Um, being united to Christ, that means that I'm not just looking for being in his presence in my spirit, but it is, as David writes and as Paul preaches, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's probably uh, pretty authoritative there, um, that the expectation and the Christian hope, and, and a hope being an expectation for us, is that just like Jesus, and this is the centerpiece of Scripture, um, we can expect not just our soul to uh, to be in the presence of Christ, but our body joined with our soul, neshish, restored, um, along with creation, restored. So the implications that this has for us about how we think about this term heaven and, and like kind of like what that'll be like and all the, the uh, spirits floating around gets kind of wiped clean by scripture itself, is what you're saying. And even the idea of the physical, I mean, we have this, you know, we're very, very influenced by this thing that we call Greco-Roman culture, or Hellenistic culture, or this idea that Socrates and Plato and people like that used to say all the time that the physical is bad, that the spiritual My is My body bad. is a prison, I need yeah. to escape from right. that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think a lot of us, as we get older, we start to kind of think that way too. We're like, oh man, my body breaks down, I can't wait until I'm free, and my spirit can just thrive, and uh, and even our, our temptations feel like they're physical ailments, like they're, they're physical yearnings and, and desires and things like that, that also a lot of times we can feel like we'll be free from if we have uh, freedom from this body. Again, I mean, you know, Pastor Kirk, when God created creation, he thought it was pretty good. And he made stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Trees, cats, dogs, rocks, footballs. Well, so that therein kind of we can start to dig into this question a little bit because if you change the perception of what's going to take place is us, look, if we're all spirits and we're all floating around, um, it makes sense that the only things that we can kind of think of un under that framework is, well, we can sing, uh, we can just kind of, you know, watch stuff. Um, we can appreciate things. Uh, we, we can we can eat. emote. We can be at peace. Yeah, yeah. We can have um, a sensation. But if I'm going to have my body, that that kind of changes the whole story. And if we're going to and, and and everything that you're saying about our physical bodies, we can also say without kind of going on too much of a trail for this. We can also say about the earth and creation. God created us and He created the earth. And the story is about the 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 new heavens and the new, new earth, the, the recreation of the earth, not the disposal of the earth. Just like with your body, it's not about the disposal of your body and, and burning up your body, but instead it's the restoration of it. So, so just like Romans 8 language, right? The exactly. creation itself groans and longs for its creator. Yeah, so the creation is waiting for the same thing that we are, and the expectation for creation is the same that ours is, and so if we're going to have bodies and we're going to be on the earth, that means then what are we going to be busy doing? Is it going to be boring? Is it going to be fun? Are we going to have things like football. Right. So, I know that we're a little bit separate in age, and so your youth group time is a little different from my youth group time. And I posed a question on my Facebook page asking, just taking a little informal survey, if there's going to be football in heaven or not. And the first, I think one of the first responses was, well, I mean, you remember the song. Uh, what is, what is, 
heaven going to be like this big, big house with lots and lots of rooms and a big, big table with lots and lots of food and a big, big yard like this. where we can play song. football uh, and a big, big house. It's my father's house. And so, uh, so who is that? Did you just make that up? No, that's that's oh. who who is is that? I think well, the band Echelon was the band that sang it for. Oh, us. fun! But I don't know if they wrote it. That's probably been around okay. for a long, long cool. time. Actually, uh, Audio Adrenaline did a version okay. of it. Uh, I think right. that's the one that someone posted on my Facebook. Yeah, I would, we, this is just an age difference. I think is it just if Amy Grant didn't sing that, though, right? No, I mean, not, she might have at some it. point, yeah. uh, but it was not. I'd be in for that. that. Yeah, of course, we can write her an email. She <laughs> might not be busy. Amy, but, if you hear me, if you're so, watching. Hook me up with that song. <laughs> so the question is, uh, is that is that song accurate? Talking about things like, all right. So, so what? I, I think we had a conversation before we kind of came on the air here about. I think one of the things that we all agree on when we talk about what's going to take place when Jesus comes back and restores all things, you've kind of opened our eyes to the fact that we'll have our physical bodies and we'll have uh, the, the earth to enjoy. But we also have this idea of what perfection is, right? So what it means to be perfect in our bodies and, and, and have the earth be perfect. And the difference, you, you distinguish the difference between what is perfect and what is in perfect relationship uh, with the Lord. So scripture does talk a whole lot about what won't be present when Jesus comes back. Things like sin, mm -hmm. which means sadness, suffering, brokenness the depression anxiety despair doom right heartache loneliness and all that's, that sort of that's stuff. really great news but I think oftentimes we say anger hatred all all that stuff is very clearly spoken of as not being present but I think sometimes we so we think like well that's going to be perfect but we take that idea of perfection and we stretch it so far that that perfection uh, we use this like a um, it, it just kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? A cinnamon, a cinnamon, a cinnamon. That would be awesome. Cinnamon for righteousness. A synonym for righteousness. Right. right? So it, it comes. It's like this. When we say Jesus is perfect, mm -hmm. we mean that he's righteous. We don't mean that like he never made a table that wobbled. Right. Right. Because he's, right. he's a carpenter. Yeah. So like, you're, if you get a if you got a table from Jesus and like one of the legs wasn't as long as the other ones, and so the thing wasn't as good as you think it should be. It's not like, well, you must not be the son of God. Yeah, it's like, yeah. well, no, that's not. What it's we an mean. over. It brings us to this over sanitized Jesus who walks around and speaks like a robot, and doesn't have the personality that Mark in Mark's gospel gives Jesus quite the personality. Um, so you can't equate perfection with like bland. And I think sometimes that's what we do when we talk about what's going to happen to us when Jesus comes back and, and when we're resurrected. That it's going to be very bland. And that you could say based on what you're telling us about this physical part of our lives and creation being important. Um, it's not going to be bland, it's going to be righteous. Um, and, and so we kind of need to distinguish those two things too, and then ask the question, so does that leave room for us to get together and play football? Is that something that is a part of what will you know, be recognized as something to enjoy creation with? Uh, or are we sanitized to the point where those kind of things aren't really, you know, because they're not considered like these holy things in the terms that we use, that, that's not going to exist, that's not going to be important. Do you remember, uh, this is going to be bad if you don't remember this, because I don't know what it's called, but it's like a perfect example of what you're talking about, so I hope you remember it. It's a <laughs> Tobey Maguire movie. Oh boy. <laughs> and it's in black and white for like oh, the first half. Oh, Pleasantville. Pleasantville, I'm glad yeah. you remember that. Okay, yeah. so one of the things in Pleasantville, and this just... Oh, this is a good. Ex I hope I hope okay. I know where you're going. With so this. in Pleasantville, yeah. everything's drab and it's all black and white. And when the basketball team is practicing, right? Have you seen that scene? I haven't. No. So the basketball team's practicing and they never miss a shot. Right. And that's supposed to be this utopian world. And then when the people sort of break from the confines of being these robots, we could say, right? Then they get color into them, right? It becomes it goes from black and white to being. Uh, Technicolor or whatever it is, and and they start missing basketball shots, and as though like now that they've got more life, like the imperfections come in. Yeah. Now that's actually if that's the metaphor, then that's actually wrong. If our idea of imperfection is lack of righteousness, but one of the things that we see about creation 
is that God does like a progressive creation. Yeah. Like the idea that God created, right? And then he put humanity, this is kind of what we were talking about before. I think this is a, I, I hope this is a clear way to put this. He, he desired that humanity continue creation yeah. and gave them the freedom to continue creation within that. And therefore, in the same way, I mean, I, I think that this makes a whole lot of sense that, you know, when we think of the word perfect, you can say, well, uh, when we think of perfect, we think of like if somebody bowls a 300, 300 a every, single time. every single time. Pleasant. And look pleasant, right. Never misses a basketball shot. And that's not really what the word perfect means when we're talking about righteousness. It means something else. It, it doesn't mean that you already know everything, that you get every answer right, that you don't ever pick up a golf club and hit a golf ball without getting a hole in one. That's not what it means. What perfect means, and perhaps perfect isn't even the right word, perfect in that in this context that we're using it regarding the new creation means righteous. Right. It means being like Christ regarding the lack of sin and being the creature that we're intended to be. And so that makes everything look really different regarding art, music, all of these things by which people have... I mean, what's the first task that God gives Adam and Eve is one of, of an imprint on creation and of a continuing of creation, of, of progressing of creation through their action by tending to the garden. Right, right. So interaction with creation is something that pleased God before the fall into sin, and it's something that will con likely continue to please God when everything is restored. And, you know, again, we, we think of things like, um, and, and I don't want to go too far down the radical, but like, what is beauty and what is to be in the in, in living in, in righteousness and again to go back to we think of it as just like appreciating things by staring at it like we're going to stare at god's creation all day and just be like wow isn't it great yes it's great boy i could do this for eternity well that's what you're going to do news. <laughs> um well but but you know god gave us five senses and he gave us tasks and, and he tells us to live in a relationship with each other, a right relationship with each other, and a right relationship with creation, a right relationship with him, a righteousness. Um, and that's exactly what Christ did. He lived in, in this perfect relationship, albeit surrounded by sin and, and, um, and doing something about sin. But that would mean, like, look, if we're talking about physical body re bodily resurrection, to engage in creation, I mean, think about, so think about not just football, but, like, think about baseball and what you like about baseball, or at least what I like about baseball. Um, creation, the interaction with creation that takes place when you play baseball is a beautiful thing. The smell of the grass and the dirt on your cleats and the, the smell of the leather and the sound of the ball snapping into your glove and the, and the, perf the sound of a, of a baseball bat con connecting with a baseball just perfectly. Um, it's, it's the sound of nature around you as you play. Um, it's just this like beautiful interaction with God's creation. And the thing that's beautiful about baseball wouldn't be, uh, again, the enjoyment of baseball wouldn't be this weird sanitized robotic thing where everybody was swinging the same way and throwing the same way and hitting home runs every pitch or, or striking out everybody. I was going to say, I mean, it depended weird. on your perspective of the hitter or the pitcher. Right. right. This goes to, like, to the whole, like, could God create a burrito so big that he could need it? Right. So, like, that, when you start to think of perfection in that way, you run into all those problems. When you see that we're just supposed to enjoy creation and there can be this progression and this improvement and this interaction with creation in a sinless way um then it now you're now you don't sound like the pleasantville billy joel song where it's like i'd rather laugh with sinners than cry with saints because sinners and sin sounds more fun and pleasantville where it really goes off the rails is it's like well people sinning is really what makes life more fun it's almost a, a defense of the fall at the gardens right and there are people who've written books about like how eve is the good guy and like freed them from the prison that they were stuck in because they were living under like God as this like evil, like Stalin like dictator, which is just again, it's just perverse idea of the love. It's that the God idea has of us. it's the idea of people as robots, which again, actually living up at true freedom is living in line with the design that you have been given. And we don't want to get too much into the weeds here. But, I mean, whenever anybody sort of thinks that, like, freedom comes outside of God's plan, you just want to ask them, well, give me, I mean, you want, to, you want to bear in mind this. We don't have control over our own actions as we are when we're apart from the Spirit. We're slave to sin. Mm -hmm. we, we do destructive things. We do things to the creation. We do things to the creation that's out there in the world, to the other people that are our neighbors, who are also creatures, and to ourselves whenever we deviate from that. But, I mean, 
the point about interacting with, uh, I mean, here in northeastern Arkansas, one of the things that people point to all the time regarding this sort of interaction with creation, being able to feel God, or, or really probably even a better way to say it is getting a foretaste of the new creation, which we get all the time here in these yeah. things that we do, uh, and actually gives sort of a, a better perspective on our life now in light of the resurrection as opposed to sort of living this life now with the idea that everything's going to be obliterated, including myself, uh, except for the spirit. Um, is the idea of people going hunting, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever anybody goes hunting, even if they don't see anything, they generally aren't like, well, I didn't get to see anything. They're generally like, oh, it was a great day anyway. Sure. Why? Because they were out in nature, and there was something cathartic about that, and there was something relaxing about that, and there was something that made that feel more sort of in tune with the creation that really we are created from. And you don't want, look, it's not a substitute for church. Don't go do it on Sunday mornings. Come to church, then go do it some other time. Please, yeah. please. But you can understand why people look at that as sort of this cathartic spiritual experience because what you're doing is you're getting back to something that probably was very, I mean, definitely was very, very common uh, for the entirety of humanity and just now a lot of times we have to make a concerted effort to get back to, which is interacting with, directly with creation. Yeah, and, and again, remembering that creation includes our bodies too. So that means like God gave you, uh, I mean, I'm sure Adam was probably like a physical specimen just like probably in really good shape. I, I can't remember who, who wrote it, but there's somebody at seminary who said, you know, if, if Adam and Eve were to walk down the street today, people would probably bow and worship them like gods because they, they before the fall, they probably just looked like what perfect human being would be. So there's a, not to get too nerdy, I mean, whenever I say that, no. Perry Landra is a book. It's the second book in the Space Trilogy. C.S. Lewis. Yes, C.S. Yeah. Lewis, second yeah. book in the Space Trilogy that, I mean, he goes to Venus and sees their Adam and Eve, and it's the same sort of experience. Yeah, and so um, creation interacting with creation in righteousness without sin, okay? I mean, we're talking about football. We've given ourselves bodies that can do these things, and, and learning and, and, and having the ingenuity to say, I can do this with my body. And create. And create. Music, things. art, I mean, even just, or work, like, you know, plow a field, uh, all, all the sort of different things. Uh, uh, just music. All of these different sort of things, in, whenever we do any one of them, really what we're doing when it is we're making, we're, we're interacting with creation, we're getting a foretaste of the time and the resurrection will be full of this sort of thing. Even just the expanse of the universe makes so much more sense within the light of the idea of the eternity in the age of the resurrection. Now, this is conjecture, sure. right? But I mean, it's, it's pretty cool to think about the fact that God gave us this, I don't know what you call it, like an empty canvas, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Not empty, but, but a, a, you know, God's really about filling the emptiness with mass and then giving it form. And it's almost like there's this entirety of a universe with which he's given mass and then kind of like sets us out and is like, give it form. And form, it looks like art and music and maybe football. Yeah, and, uh, and so you can't start to look at heaven in this like, over sanitized way where it's um, like God doesn't care about all that stuff because he obviously does. He loves chickens. He loves chickens. He loves ducks. Yeah. Cows. Yeah. And the cool Duck thing about platypuses. The cool thing that, that this all kind of uh, the implication of all this stuff that we're talking about here is you can live like this well you can't but you can you can get a, like you said, a foretaste, foretaste of this now. And so now, this is where this gives meaning to today, to you. If you're a football player right now, you can, although in a broken creation, and although there's injury, and although there's, you know, times where... Age. Age and... Age. Except for... <laughs> TV 12, he's figured it out. Right. Um, you can live in, in you know, Imperfect righteousness, but but you know, you can you can live this way, give glory to God, and get a foretaste of the joy that we're supposed to have in creation today. And he, I'll tell you what, I, we we've got to bring up this really important point because we talked about the other things that aren't there in creation, and there are some people that can't do that, right? So there's some people who can't play football, right. can't sing, yes, can't can't create, can't plow a field, can't walk, can't see, can't hear, 
can't speak. I mean, guess what else there's not in the new creation? And this is a really big hope for those people as well. Uh, you know, Jesus says to uh, the disciples of John the Baptist, he tells John this, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, yeah. the mute speak, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. Well, that's happening locally to Jesus wherever he's going. When Jesus is the king of all creation, he is the king of all creation now. But when he returns as the king of all creation and reigns over the earth, all that blindness, all the deafness, all the lameness, all the muteness, all those physical ailments that people suffer from are also gone, and they'll come, the biblical language that's used, I love, in Malachi, they'll come leaping out of their graves like fawns from a stall. I mean, that's a beautiful image that really should be a great encouragement, I think, to anybody who has any of those physical ailments as well. Absolutely. And uh, for anybody who has lost somebody that you would say um, was before you were ready to lose them. Um, I didn't get to do this, right? I didn't get to do this, they say. Yes. Oh, yeah. Look, um, I mean, we've said it many times and in many ways before, but there's no such thing as a life that doesn't get to be fully lived for those who are in Christ. Right. Because there is, <laughs> look, there's going to be time to make up for the um, for the earthly life that you may feel that you missed out on. And there's not going to be anybody. And this is the point, one of the points that we're trying to make. There isn't going to be anybody who is sitting in God's new creation, resurrected, body and soul, joined together among the faithful, who's going to say, you know what? Not worth it. The stuff that I experienced on the earth was so bad, I would have rather had a good deal on, on during my earthly life than have what I'm seeing and witnessing and, and experiencing now. Um, and I mean, that just again is is the reason that we can endure things that are difficult uh, during this earthly life. And it's again, it's the reason that we can we mourn because those things are real and they're hard and they're and they're difficult. And we but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Exactly. Um, so let's take a trip down memory lane. Uh -oh. The year is 1990, 92, let's say, 92. You're on Pine Hill Road next to our house in what we call the side yard. Side yard? Yeah. And what did we do in the side yard perpetually, Pastor Kirk? I mean, mostly, uh, every sport was played on that side yard, but it was mostly playing football. Did side any yard. grass grow in that side yard? The grass was beaten down to, it was just flat dirt. It was flat dirt, and we'd, we'd make lines of scrimmage perpetually with each yeah. play, and draw a line in the dirt. I mean, so grass didn't have a chance. Nope. Now, those games were legendary, they were epic. We would have an ebb and flow of people who would come and go, both from our neighborhood and from, oh, just friends who would come in and play as they were at our house. Yeah. Very Sandlot-esque, yes. for those who've seen the movie Sandlot. And, and for, for the age that we were and everything like that, very, very organized, I'd like to say, you know. There wasn't, you know, it's, we, we tried to run a tight ship as well. Um, those are some of my favorite memories. Yeah, me too. I don't know about you. Me too. Um, I can for certain say that in hindsight, looking back on those, I felt like doing that was a foretaste of what I think heaven would be like. And so we could grab together, you know, Ryan and Timmy and Robbie and little Pat and, yeah. and Justin and, you know, my buddies and your buddies and everybody all together and grab a, I mean, it can just be one of them little rocket Nerf footballs. and. Count to five, Mississippi, and when you're coming in on a blitz, uh, two hand touch, two completions as a first down. I mean, I think the rules themselves were about as perfect to uh, perfect to righteous as yeah. it possibly be. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know there is this like longing for that kind of uh, you know innocent being a loaded word here, but like the innocence of where we all kind of wish we could go back to those days, and it's like it felt more like a foretaste where I didn't have to worry. Like when we we're playing on that side yard, you know what I was worried about? Nothing, <laughs> literally the ball. nothing. Right. Um, and and like, boy, those were simpler times. And wouldn't it be great if there was, if we could all go? I mean, with what's going on in the world today, you know, to be able to just play catch with my dad, which is how I got to know our dad, was like playing catch in the, in, in the side yard, that same side yard, and just talking and learning about life and sharing experiences and the snap of the ball into the glove, just like a very a time that you long for. And that's kind of what creation and 
God's people do now. It's, it's, it's this longing for what we know is coming, this time where we'll be together again uh, with, with Jesus and, and go back to that simpler time. And to, to be able to change your outlook of what that will be like from what you know TV shows in Hollywood and maybe some books that you've read about what heaven is like just seems so, it just doesn't give credit to the beauty of, of creation and the, the meticulous way in which God has created us to enjoy what he has given us and enjoy him, to instead say, you know what, I have, I have experienced tastes of this, and I love it. And I really, it's going to be that, but cranked up yeah. to, to a level that we, we can only imagine at this point. I, I have a very, well, I won't give you the whole spiel now because it would take forever, but I've got this, I've got an idea, and I don't want to be too lofty sounding here, but nostalgia. Right, nostalgia is a real thing. It's it's what makes us look back on things and long for it. Um, and it can be something like having played football or catch uh, at a certain point in life. It can even be something like a movie, a song. You know, so much of even pop culture that we like. A lot of times we like it because it's associated with a certain phase within our own lives. I mean, songs do this probably as good as anything. You can remember, like I can't hear Boys to Men without being reminded of the fact that I can't roller skate. You want to know why? Because that was the jam that was on every time that we were in fourth and fifth grade and we went on a field trip. and To the roller rink. Yeah, to the roller yeah. rink. And all the, the boys and men would come on, and that's when everybody paired up and held hands while they were skating around the rink. I, I had to climb on the wall because I couldn't roller skate. But now that we've gone uh, to the end of the road. I think that actually, I think I'm old enough that that's like later period boys to oh, men okay. Okay. uh i like it obviously wasn't uh oh i can't say what the words i shouldn't have said you on no, this. I no, apologize. Words, no no i i remember the words to it it's it's it, but it's about doing an act that you should wait for marriage for so i won't repeat yeah, that one you know what I'm okay, okay yeah. i think i got it, I think I got it. Um, but so, yes. but the idea of nostalgia really i think is when you look back upon your life and you see a time where you felt that foretaste and though it is gone you desire it again now, all of us have that sense of nostalgia. Everybody has it, whether you know Jesus or not. And what really is just, it, what really I think that it shows is us being in tune, even if we don't realize it, with creation in a way where we saw a moment and we're like, this, this thing, if I could go back to it, then I would get a sense of the way it's supposed to be again. And the wonderful thing about nostalgia is that you don't have to have a sense of sadness with it if you have hope in Christ, because you can feel like you're going to go back to that place, only it's going to be even better. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I think the, the, the challenge that we have in the world right now is that we try to oftentimes fill that longing with artificial kind of uh, things. Like so, so, I mean, look, we're all, we're all creating false gods all the time by chasing. I mean, look, it might be, uh, it might be people who drink. It might be people who dr do drugs. It might be people who obsess about work. Who obsess about sex it might be all, all kinds of things. I mean, I think you missed the two biggest ones, which is money and youth. Money, I mean, those are the absolutely. two within our culture. Money and youth are the two things that people seem to clamor after more than any other. And 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 again, it's like we go after those things, and then there's always this consequence that's associated with them, whether it's now or later. That that there's this sense of either guilt that's associated with it, or, or whatever the consequence. Or it'll be. fail you. It'll just fail you. The great thing about the nostalgia that comes from the longing of the righteousness, that the, the actual like right relationship with creation, because of the right relationship that we have with our Creator, it's gonna be. I'll go back to using that word. It's gonna be perfect. And, and we're going to understand what it was supposed to be all along. And there won't be any of the sorrow and guilt and shame associated with it because those things have died on the cross. And, uh, and when we die, that, that will be the end of that part of our story, to be in the presence of Jesus until, and we'll say, how long, Lord? And, and until one day he returns, and then we'll begin to see um, and experience just how wonderful God's creation is. And a right relationship in, uh, in righteousness with him and with the uh, creation as creatures that were made by him to enjoy it uh, can really be. And that is something to look forward to, not something to poo-poo, not something to say, oh, brother, I'm going to play harp for four billion years or four billion years. And it allows you to enjoy things now in a different way. Absolutely. I mean, because really what you can do is you can, I mean, St. C.S. Lewis, to quote him twice in one sitting, uh, has this. 
uh, thing where he says that he, he never feels closer to God than when he's sitting under a tree reading a book. And, and what he means by that is just he's interacting with creation in the way that he can tell he was designed and made to do so. And that's great. I'll tell you what, I tell you what I think will be really fun too, Pastor Chris. Lay it on me. There's going to be a lot of really good athletes, and I can't wait to have like a, for example, a Bo Jackson with a resurrection restored hip, because you know that was the injury that really shortened his career. He had a, he had a, a hip eventually go out of socket. You can see him put it back in there too. Yeah, it's rough. yeah, yeah. But he'll have a resurrected hip. I think I'm going to pick Bo. If you can't pick Jesus, right? First, <laughs> I think I might take Bo Jackson. Number one, if we're out in the side yard on 30 Pine Hill Road doing a, yeah. doing a, a, I pick you, I pick you. If I get to be captain, Bo Jackson probably be captain if he's in the game. I, I think he probably can't go wrong with that. Maybe I'll try to even it out with uh, with uh, who else? With Reggie White. Reggie White. Yeah. that would be pretty maybe good. He, maybe he could match. Reggie up White with trying to tackle Bo Jackson in the new heavens and new earth. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. in on that. <laughs> I think I think that'd be worth watching. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, so, again, this is all, uh, a lot of this is conjecture, but these are things that are taken from Scripture that you can kind of, you can kind of, um, you, you can, I think, safely assume a lot of this stuff. Um, the thing, though, that we can say with 100% certainty, I think, uh, as Paul says in Romans 8, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's not going to be boring. No. It's not going to be lame. Lots of music. Lots you're, of animals. You're going to want to be food. Going to be like a wedding feast. Yes. Um, and weddings are fun. Yes. Weddings are fun. Um, so... Again, um, I think I think it's a great reminder for us who are going through a really broken creation right now to to remember to have the hope of the restoration of creation, including our own physical bodies. Um, whether you are someone who gets sick or someone who is having suffering of your body of some some kind of a way, shape, or form, or you just look around you and you say, "Man, things are really broken, really messed up." That's why we are drawn. One of the many reasons why we're drawn to Christ is because uh, we know that he is the one who can not only restore us, but restore this broken world. And one day that is exactly what he promises to do. It's pretty awesome. Hey, really quick, side question that's inappropriate because it's going to take three hours for you to properly answer. Oh, right. I love this. Cheeseburgers. In the new creation? Yeah. I know. Okay. So this is definitely like a whole other subject. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the lion will have flatted teeth like the calf. Yeah. If there's one thing that probably is not there, and it's conjecture, it's you're probably not. You're not. You're gonna be fine. I'm gonna, gonna be like fine. It. It's I just mean, hard for my sinful mind to think that. So I mean, fine. you know, when you look at creation, right? I mean, just the way the creation was originally intended to be made, uh, you're gonna see the fact that Adam and Eve are eating fruit from the trees, and the animals are eating the plants. Yeah. So, and then nobody's eating each other. Yeah. Now there, we get into so this is where we really don't know. You talk about conjecture. What do you do with in John 21, John chapter 21, um, the resurrected Jesus mm -hmm. eats fish. Eats fish. So, so you're saying it's back into it. Ah, Kurt Cobain may have it right. Oh, boy. Okay. It's okay to eat fish because they don't have any feelings. Okay. That's not in the Bible. That's you can do a lot stuff. with fish. Yes. You can do a lot with well, fish. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure you're going to get to eat the fish, too. But Jesus did post-resurrection. Look, there are a lot of these things. I mean, people always want to know, are we naked? I mean, I don't think so. I don't know. Uh, you're not going to worry about it either way. Um, People want to know how old am I? I think be? my son is trying to live in the oh, post resurrection Oh, getting a foretaste right of the kingdom yes, to come, right? Yes. That's um, how old are we going to be, too? I mean, it's sort of a question that's just. I got some theories, but we'll save that for another time. Right. So a lot of people will say things like, you know, 33, mm -hmm. because that's the age Larry of Larry Bird. Because of Larry Bird. <laughs> I mean, you know where I was going. <laughs> right. right. What is the perfect human specimen? <laughs> well, we all know. Well, how old was Larry Bird in 86? And we're all going to have a, a caterpillar mustache yes. and a mullet, too. Oh, I'm in. Yeah. That's uh, yes. awesome. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, there are more questions that go with this that, that we can discuss another time, like, you know, human relationships and things like that. Those are all real. But, but, but the cool thing Do I get to play Xbox? Yeah. So the baseline, though, that we want to work with and to think about these things and to look forward to these things is, again, to remember what our actual hope is in. It's not... To, so get rid of the idea of what, you know, the movie Patrick Swayze and Ghost is doing. That's not a hopeful situation. That is not a pleasant thing to, to reach out and look forward to. Um, just sitting and be becoming an angel and, and just singing all day um, for billions of years doesn't sound like a really fun time becoming all the same person and the same robot type person, all that stuff. Instead, build your, build your hopeful expectation 
on, again, a great place to start might be that nostalgia and be like, you know, there's, there's things in this world that are beautiful and wonderful and created and gifts of God. The Transformers well, animated movie. The Transformers the animated movie. Not the Michael Bay movies. Not the live action movies. Those will definitely not no. be oh. in God's name. But I'll tell you what. But I hope Michael Bay's there. Oh yeah, of course. Well, we hope everybody's there. Yeah. I just don't want his movies there. No, Transformers the animated movie. Definitely. It's a piece of art. I mean, whenever I look back on that, you know. The first Ninja Turtles movie. The first live action one. See, these are the kind of conversations that you can have when you have the expectation of a, of a restore. <laughs> right, absolutely. It'll be great. All right. Well, hey. Uh... Pastor Aaron, any closing thoughts? Um, practice your football. You'll get a head start in the new new resurrection. I'm telling you, Sandlot football, I'm coming, I'm coming for all y'all. He, Pastor Aaron, was pretty pretty good back when we were on that we side had, yard. We had a good, we had a good crew. We had a good crew. Something about having kids it takes a little bit away from hand eye coordination. I'm there <laughs> now. Don't watch me at the Oh, you're good at football. Throw a football. You'll be. I'm not picking you in the, in the resurrection. All right, well, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Uh, we hope that you join us next time as we continue to unpack the wonders of what God has given us through, uh, through his word, through his sacraments, through himself, which is really great. So uh, we'll end as we always do, reminding you that Jesus loves you. So do we. Bye, everybody. Bye.